We are continuing our series today called Is Christ Enough? And so we are walking through the letter of Colossians from the Apostle Paul to the church in the ancient city of Colossae. And so we have been just tracking right along and looking at all the different things going on uh, that Paul addresses verse by verse. It's been very, very intriguing to say the least. Uh, So we're going to continue that today, and we're going to be in verses 20 and 21 of chapter 3. So Colossians 3, 20 and 21. Before we dig into that, though, let me pray, and let's ask the Lord to bless his word today uh, as we receive it. Would you pray with me? Thank you, Jesus, for your word. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for baptism. Thank you, Lord, that we get to celebrate with those today who have participated in this beautiful symbol of what you have done for them. We thank you, Lord. We thank you that we can't. We can't do this on our own. We thank you for that. Lord, it's the fact that we can't do it that makes your grace so marvelous and so wonderful. Your love is so never-ending, so forever and eternal. We thank you, Jesus, for showing us sacrificial love. Help us today as we look at these verses As we talk about these subjects, would you give us your wisdom? Would you speak to our hearts, every person in here, in this room? Would you speak to us, Holy Spirit? It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So if you look at Colossians 3, verse 17, a few verses before this, you see Paul kind of summarize this this theme that we find in chapter 3 of Colossians. He says, and whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So as we have seen in this letter, specifically in chapter three, Paul makes it very clear that our entire lives change when we come to trust Jesus Christ as our savior. Everything changes. We are a new creation in Christ. The old person that we once knew has been buried is dead. We saw that, right? The picture of baptism, that's what it represents. But now we have new life. We come out of the water. We're a new person in Christ. And it's all what he has done, nothing we could do. That's the gospel. And so this this new life, this new heart condition This new standing before God, being in good standing, it it, it should affect everything we do. Every single part of our lives should be exposed to this great truth and should be transformed by this great new condition that we find ourselves in, a child of God. You see, and that, that includes every relationship we have. And if you really want to get down to where the rubber meets the road, the nuts and bolts of this, you have to look at your own house. You have to look at your own home and see where this transformation is happening. Because let's be honest, you know, we can, we can kind of fake it till we make it in terms of out there in the world, but whoever lives in your house, they know the real you, right? They know that you don't put your dirty laundry where it's supposed to go, right? They know that you don't always say the kindest things, right? So we know that we are, we are our truest selves at home. So it makes sense, right? It makes sense that Paul addresses the household, specifically in the ancient culture. He addresses different relationships and how they operate, but these principles and these truths are just as much true and relevant today as well. So last week, we saw that Paul addresses six different people in these verses here, one after the other, very short statements that he makes about each person in the house. He addresses wives, Husbands, children, fathers, bond servants, and masters. Now, we're going to talk about what a bond servant and master is next week, all right? But last week, we talked about wives and husbands, and we saw how both a husband and a wife are both looking to Jesus as their example, as the model they should follow. This week, we turn our attention to what Paul addresses next children and parents, the parent-child relationship. And we're going to see really a similar conclusion. We're going to see that both kids and parents should look to Jesus as their example in their lives and how they conduct themselves in the home. All right, so our kids from uh, 
Our elementary school kids are in the service today. Welcome, kids. We're glad y'all are here. All right. So I'm talking to you today. All right. At least half of this sermon is directly to you. So you got to listen. Okay. All right. Colossians chapter three, verses 20 and 21. Here we go. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Now, obviously, these are very short sentences, short statements. Paul's not saying everything there is to say here about children and parents, right? So he doesn't say anything here about the really important stuff, parents, like how you should react when you step on a Lego that should have been picked up, right? We've all been there, (laughs) right? Or kids, how you should respond when your dad is just trying to have fun, but he's actually embarrassing you in public, right? Yeah, does that ever happen? Maybe, I'm that dad, anybody else, right? But Paul's point here, Paul's point here is consistent. Even though he doesn't address everything there is to say, His point is very consistent with his theme in chapter 3. The parent-child relationship should be modeled after this new life that we have in Christ. Children and parents are both called to seek the things above, as we saw in these earlier verses. To live according to God's design and therefore their relationship between the parent and the child, it will be a demonstration of God's own love and character. So, both a Christian parent and child have responsibility in this relationship, but the roles are different, right? Just as the husband and the wife are both looking to Jesus but playing different roles that God gives us to play, well, the parent and the child are also looking to Christ but playing different roles. Though our modern-day context, of course, is, is very different than when Paul wrote this letter, right? There weren't, you know, there wasn't any such thing as a tablet or Netflix or those spinny thingies, whatever that the kids have these days. You know what I mean? Like they didn't have any of that back then. So I don't know what they played with, but it was a very different context, but the principle and the truth is the same. So just like we did last week, we're going to go to the parallel passage in Ephesians and see how Paul elaborated some on this topic. All right. So Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1, this is a parallel passage, similar uh, letter that Paul wrote to a different church, but again, the truths are the same. So here we go. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. All right, so he addresses children here first, just as he did in Colossians, all right? But back in Colossians, verse 20, what did he say? He says that when children obey their parents, it pleases the Lord. And here in verse 1, he says that this is right. So we know, we know God created parents to be the primary authority in their kids' lives, right? He designed the parent-child relationship to work in such a way that when children are obeying under their parents' good and loving authority, this relationship does please the Lord. In other words, it's good. It's right. It brings glory to God. Because, why? It reflects the relationship of God's people. Ultimately, that's what the parent-child relationship is able or has the capacity to reflect. Our heavenly Father, God, right? He loves His children, right? He takes care of His children, He sacrificially loves his children, right? And us as a church, we should submit to his authority. And when both of those things are happening, right, it's a beautiful relationship. It's a beautiful picture. Theologian Richard Koken says, the relationship of a parent and child is, after marriage, the most powerful illustration of the loving relationship between God and his people. That's a pretty that's a pretty bold statement, right? We know that the scriptures speak a lot, and we, we looked at this last week, right? The, the husband-wife relationship, that marriage relationship, it shows a picture of Christ and his church, but also the parent-child relationship does. It pleases the Lord when we obey our Heavenly Father. He knows 
what is good and right and true for us. He knows what's in our best interest. Now, sometimes adults, we can be rebellious children of God, can't we? Right? We don't always think that God knows what's best for us, do we? So we don't trust him sometimes. We don't come to him first for help, right? We go to other sources. Sometimes we rebel against his good design and obedience and uh, commands, right? We disobey, right? So adults, we, we understand, don't we? We know what it's like to not want to obey our heavenly father. But when we do, we know and acknowledge that he knows what's in our best interest, And when we submit to him in obedience, this is good for everyone. Well, the same is true when a child submits and obeys the parent, right? Now, this is under the, this is with the understanding given the fact that the parent is leading the child to love the Lord. So this is two Christian parents today, right? And we're going to talk about more, more on that later. But when children are obeying their parents, yes, it brings glory to God. It really, really does. Uh, Another theologian, David Garland, says that above all, a child owes obedience to the Lord, though, not just the parents, right? He says the child's independent relationship with the Lord surpasses the relationship with parents. And Christ's obedience to his Father in all things serves as the model. Think about that. Kids, your relationship to God is what will always be primary and most important in your life. So kids, you are looking to Jesus Christ as your example. That's ultimately kids who you have to look to, right? Students, teenagers in here today. You have to look to Jesus to set the true and good example of obedience and what submission actually looks like. Look at how Jesus submitted to the Father's will. Look at how Jesus, though on the night that he was betrayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, he cried out to the Lord, even if it's not, right, it's not the cup that I want to drink, but, but he said that God's will should be done, right? He submitted to God's will in that moment. Jesus always fully obeyed God, the Father, in all things because this was good and this was right. And God the Father was pleased with this. So Paul continues then, speaking to kids in verse 2 and 3 of Ephesians 6. He says, honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. So what is Paul quoting there? There's quotations there. He's quoting one of the Ten Commandments, right? He's quoting the fifth commandment from Exodus chapter 20. And in that original context, he was speaking, right? God was speaking to the Israelites, right? And so he's telling those children of that nation, he says, if you obey, right, things will go well for you. Now, I want to read this to you. As the ESV commentary puts it, it says not the the promise here in our our modern day and, and, and also in which Paul's writing, it's not physical land, right? He was talking to the Israelites then, but it is eternal life. Now, Paul's not teaching salvation on the basis of obedience or the basis of works. We know that. But he says the obedience, it says the obedience of children is evidence that they know God and it results in receiving blessings from God. So in other words, when children obey their parents and the parents are loving their children in a biblical way, the family will thrive, right? The family will thrive, It's good for everyone. It's good for the parents. It's good for the kids. It's good for everyone around them. It's good for everyone that knows them and interacts with them. Everyone benefits, right? So this is God's design. So kids and students here in the room, I want to give you, I want you guys to listen closely, okay? I'm going to give you some points, and these are just for you, all right? So these are the points for the kids and the students in the room today, I want you to take notes if you, if you have something to write with, all right? Or maybe you have the sheet that was already prepared for you that our kids got today. All right, kids, y'all ready? So kids and students, here we go. Why should you obey your parents? Right, that's the question. <laughs> Somebody raised their hand. <laughs> that's good. I would love, I'll, hear, I'll hear your answer after the service. That's good. <laughs> I'm glad that you're eager and you know the answer. Why should I obey my parents? Well, number one, guess what? It makes God happy. All right? It makes God happy, right? 
Because when you are following the example of Jesus, just like he obeyed his heavenly father, it pleases the Lord. It pleases God, right? Children, obey your parents for this is right, for this pleases the Lord, the Bible says. So isn't it great to make God happy, right? We love when our heavenly father is pleased with us. So when you obey your parents, God is so happy with that. He really is. It's true. Number two, all right, kids and students, it's good for me and my family, right? Why should you obey your parents? It's good for you and it's good for your family, right? As we just saw, honor your father and mother, right? Your family life and the way that you interact with your parents, if you obey what they actually say, guess what? That's good for you, right? Things go good for you. I mean, how many of you know that things don't go well for you when you disobey your parents, right? I mean, that's pretty logical, right? So if you disobey your parents, things probably aren't going to go too great. But if you do obey your parents, things will go well. And it'll be good for your whole family, right? It presents a peaceful relationship in the home. Okay, that's why you should obey your parents, kids, that we saw there in the verses. All right, but here's how. How should you obey your parents? That's a good question, isn't it? All right, one point here, but three things in this one point. Ready? You should obey your parents all the way right away with a happy heart, all right? Now, this is what we say in our home, okay? <laughs> this isn't exactly out of Ephesians, but this is what we say in the Wilkes house. All the way, right away, with a happy heart. Now, what does that mean? Well, let's just say that your parents ask you to clean your room. Now, does that mean that you clean half your room, right? Does that mean you just clean a few of the items and then give up and say that you're tired? Nope, I've heard that one before, right? <laughs> nope. Do you obey uh, later, right? Do you wait to obey? Do you let some time pass and maybe go, go do something else before you obey and clean your room? Nope, right? And do you obey or do you clean your room uh, with a sad face or complaining about it perhaps, right? Y'all wouldn't do that, would you, right? So what should we do? We should obey all the way. In other words, do everything that your parent asks and then you do it right away so you don't have to wait right? You do it when they ask immediately and you do it happily, right? You do it with joy. You do it because guess what? It brings God glory, right? It makes God happy and it's good for you and it's good for the family, right? So we want to obey kids, right? Because all the way, right away with a happy heart brings God glory. It really does, right? But here's the thing. Here's the thing. And I'm speaking to everyone now. Obedience, obedience is learned, Obedience is learned. It's not inherent to our nature, right? So adults, when you were growing up as a child, did anybody have to teach you how to do the wrong thing, <laughs> right? Did anyone have to teach you how to disobey your parents? No, you already knew how to do that and you probably did it very well at some times, right? So that comes naturally, but we all have to learn what the right thing is first, and then also we have to learn how to live in what is good and right and true. And whose job is that? Whose job is it to teach the kids and the students, right? The teenagers in our lives. Whose job is it to teach them what is good, what is right, what is true? To set that example. Parents, guardians, that's your job. That's your job. That's not the child's job, right? It's the parent's job to instruct the child on what is good and right and true in this world, and then also how to live in obedience to God's truths specifically. So now we turn our attention, Paul turns his attention to the parent side of this, specifically fathers. Look at verse 21 of Colossians 3. He says, fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. And now the parallel passage in Ephesians 6, verse 4, he says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So Paul is addressing fathers specifically here because they, as we saw last week, fathers, husbands, are the spiritual leaders of the home. But this, of course, also applies to mothers, of course it does, because the father and the mother are parenting the child together and need to heed these instructions. So, so what does it mean then to not provoke your kids to anger? All right, 
to not discourage them. Why is that important for Paul to say? Well, to quote Richard Koken again, he says, this is really good. He says, our children need disciplined love and loving discipline, not indulgence or bullying. Let me say that again. He says, our children need disciplined love and loving discipline. Now, I love this quote because I think it's, it just strikes to the heart of the balance that we must find as parents as we parent our children and not provoke them to anger, to anger, not lead them to discouragement. What is disciplined love? Well, we all love our kids. Absolutely, we love our kids, right? But if we smother our children with this idea that they can essentially do whatever they want and get away with it. If us as parents, if we in our own insecurities project that onto our children to the point where we want them to just like us and we want them to just be our friends and our buddies, that's great unless it becomes overwhelmingly an indulgence where essentially we give the child exactly what the child wants to get them to like us. That's dangerous. So our love for our kids must be a disciplined love, right? It must not be an indulgence. It must be a proper good love that seeks their benefit and is willing to discipline if necessary. And that leads to the second half of that quote. Our discipline should be loving, Right? So the discipline should not be harsh or unnecessary. Right? The discipline should not be like you're putting your kids through a boot camp and they never know your love. They never hear you say, I love you. And maybe you grew up in a home like that. And I understand that there could be some, some serious trauma in your own heart and mind. But you, as a parent now, you have an opportunity to love your children with a disciplined love and a loving discipline. I think it's a great opportunity that we all have. It's not easy, though. As we seek to do this, we must constantly keep coming back to Christ. We must constantly keep coming back to God Himself and admit our weakness as parents. Admit that we don't have it figured out and there is no perfect formula to follow. Sometimes it's intimidating to look at all the other parental advice out there in the world. So many others who publish books and blogs and all these things. Those resources absolutely can be helpful. But it can also be depressing. Nobody has it figured out perfectly. But we look. That's why we must continue to look to the Scriptures. Continue to look to Jesus, to God Himself as the example. God loves justice. God loves mercy. God portrays both perfectly in the way he parents us these things, right? Justice and mercy. God portrays these things perfectly. He is a wonderful parent to us, so to speak. So we must seek to do the same with our kids. Parents, the more you know and love God's own heart and his character, the easier it will be to display that to your kids in the way that you parent them. The NIV Biblical Theology Study Bible says, uh, says something very similar to what Koken said about the loving discipline and the disciplined love. It says, coercive dominance on the one hand or a complete lack of discipline on the other hand can destroy children, right? Coercive dominance or lack of discipline, both things can destroy a child. Children can become discouraged by being unnecessarily provoked nagged or belittled, or they can become discouraged by being ignored and neglected. You see, parents, we have to keep coming back to that wonderful, beautiful example of God himself. To be honest, to be candid, you know, Paul does address dads, fathers specifically here. So dads, we can be, we can be easily angered sometimes, can't we? We must be intentional as fathers, to not be harsh with our kids or speak down to them as if they're not humans themselves created in the image of God. 
We must not be harsh with them so as to not provoke them to be angry or grow discouraged over time. So don't just talk down to them and look for quick obedience without explanation. Instead, as Paul says, I love that he uses the word instead, right? Instead, what should we do? Take the time to, as Paul says, bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So in other words, parents, instead of demanding a quick response with no explanation, what should we do? We should take time to instruct. Now, listen, I get it. If you're getting all the kids in the car, and like us, they all three have to be buckled in the car seat still, and I'm looking forward to kind of that, getting out of that stage of life, you know, like when we don't have to buckle each kid, right? But if you're, I, I get it. In the moment, right, if, you know, somebody's crying and somebody threw something at somebody else, of course there's quick moments, right? There's quick moments where we can put an end to something quickly in a nice way, but on a normal pattern and a normal basis, take the time to instruct Take the time to instruct, right, as we raise our kids to love the Lord. So what does it look like? What does it look like for parents, not just fathers, but but yes, fathers and spiritual leaders of the home, what does it look like to raise your kids in what Paul calls the discipline or training and instruction of the Lord? Well, I want to share some points from you from from a sermon I preached back in last August from Deuteronomy chapter six, there's some very just amazing golden truth in Deuteronomy chapter six, verses four through nine. So parents, this is your turn to listen up, okay? These points are for you. Parents and guardians in the room today, how can I raise my kids to know and love God? How can I raise my kids to know and love God? All right, let's look at Deuteronomy six. I wanna read verses four through nine and then give you three quick points about what we find here. All right? So God says to the nation of Israel in the Old Testament, He says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. So three things I think we see here in this passage that can help us raise our kids to love the Lord, to know the Lord, all right? Number one, we see in here structured teaching, right? That's what we see here. If you look at verse seven again, what does it say? It says, you shall teach them diligently to your children. We are teaching our children the things of God, the truths of God. That's what Moses is saying here. The primary place... Parents, the primary place where discipleship and teaching of God's word needs to happen first is your house, right? In the home. Now listen, the church is called to play a certain role in the discipleship of your children. Yes, absolutely. We love doing that here at Kernan, right? We invest a lot in that process here at Kernan. However, The first place, the primary place where your kids should learn about the Bible and learn about who God is, is in your house. God has designated this duty to you, parents. And it also, it makes practical sense when you think about it. I mean, how many hours are you even here on this church campus a week, right? I don't know, maybe two or three, right? Four at best. And then how many hours are your kids spending with you at home all week, right? So, I mean, logically it makes sense even outside of this passage. But to do this, right, to do this, we're going to have to teach our kids about God and the Bible in a structured way. So to do that diligently, as we're told, you will have to set aside some time, right? Parents, so you have to, you have to set aside time in your routines, in your pattern, whatever that is, right? your weekly schedule, your daily schedule. You need to be consistent with that time. And I would say lean heavily on great age-appropriate resources, 
right? Don't try to just make up a Bible study on your own. I mean, you can if you feel like you can do that, but there are so many really good resources for all ages. There really are. Uh, we're, we live in a great time. We really do, right? Not just on the internet, but printed material, uh, great books that you can find. Um, so I do want to say this, you know, if you're, if you're struggling or, or perhaps you have already moved through one book or a resource and you're looking for another um, and you're a parent here today, then by all means, please reach out to our next gen uh, ministry staff. Christy Wilkes is our preschool director. Uh, Jessica Shepard is our kids director. And Will Bryson is our student director. And uh, all three of them uh, the, at those different age levels would be more than happy uh, to reach out and, and connect with you about recommending certain resources that you could use at home uh, to read with your kids or to look at and to experience. So please, that's part of our job here on staff at the church is to equip you. We want you to succeed. Uh, so please reach out to us. You can email all of those people I just named. You can look on our church website and see their emails uh, and, and message them and let them know like, hey, do you have any recommended resources? We would love to do this or we would love to do that. Um, please reach out to them. We would love we would love to help you. So that's the first thing we see here in verses four through nine of Deuteronomy six. It's, it's actual teaching of the Bible, right? Learning about God in the home, all right? The second thing that we see here is ongoing conversation and demonstration. Between the parent and the child, there's ongoing conversation or dialogue about spiritual things, about God and demonstration. So, so what do we mean by that? Look at verse seven again. Moses says, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise, right? So, so Moses is being very clear here. There are moments, right? There are key moments throughout the day. There are key moments throughout the week that you have to take advantage of as a parent, but this is ongoing, Right? There should be ongoing open dialogue with your child, whether they are 18 years old right, or eight years old. It doesn't matter. There should be ongoing dialogue. The conversation is really never ending. right? But also think about it. If you are intentionally spending time with your kids, talking about the things of God and the, just the ordinary moments of life, that means they will be around you. They will be watching you, right? They will be watching the way that you handle certain situations. They will be watching and observing the way that you handle conflict in your house, right? Probably a bulk of what kids are learning is just through sheer observation, not even just in the structured teaching time. That part is important. But what they're really learning is how you talk to each other as a married couple, is how you interact with one another, how you interact with somebody on the phone or you know, when they look at your text message and they see what you said, right? There's all kinds of things, right? That they can observe these days. So parents, what are we demonstrating to our children? You know, just another note too, to put here in terms of demonstration, just showing your kids that you do prioritize being at church on a weekly basis is so important for a kid's upbringing. For a kid to grow up knowing that his or her parents loved the Lord and loved the church and wanted to grow with other Christians in Christian community, that is so important. That is such good, solid foundation and security in a child's heart and mind to know that they are loved not only by their parents who love the Lord, but they are also loved by a church family that loves them as well. That is pivotal. It really is. So, so not only are we speaking to kids about the things of God verbally on an ongoing basis, right? Parents, we should be modeling the right behavior for them as well. All right, the last thing, the final thing we see here in Deut Deuteronomy 6 is not only is there the structured teaching, the ongoing conversation and demonstration, but number three, constant reminders. Constant reminders of our love for God. Look what... Uh, Moses says in Deuteronomy 6, 8 and 9, he says, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Now, this doesn't have to be literal physical reminders, right? Paintings or artwork that you put around your house, though it can be. If you wanted to do that, great, that's fine. But the point is, 
What is he saying here? We must let God's truth into our hearts and declare this, right? And determine that our home is going to be governed by God's word, right? So parents, do you want your home to be governed by God's word or do you want your home to be governed ultimately by your opinions on life, right? Because one of those things is solid and foundational and the other one is shifting sand, right? God's word must be what our homes are governed by. It's not to say that your opinions don't matter, but ultimately your kids need God's truth more than your opinions on whatever, right? We also don't want society's opinions governing our home. We want God's word governing our home. So the question here then under this third point is how can you make that obvious? How can you creatively and constantly remind your family that our house is built on the Bible, on God's word. How can you remind your family of that, right? Hey, be creative. That's the challenge. Maybe, uh, maybe you could, you know, come up with just some little neat way and, and every, every week or every so often you write a certain uh, passage or verse on a on an index card and tape it to everybody's bathroom mirror, right? And you all learn the verse together or who, I don't know, whatever, right? Whatever you want to do, there's all kinds of creative ways to constantly remind your family, we are a house that is, is submitted to God's word. We love Jesus in this house, all right? So in closing today, all right, kids, I want you to hear me. All right, listen up, kids. I want, and I'm being serious. You cannot be perfect. All right, you will never be perfect. Now, don't be sad about that. I'm about to tell you some really good news, okay? Adults, <laughs> parents, let me tell you something. You cannot be perfect, okay? Parents, you will never be the perfect parent, all right? Family Living or whatever magazine is not gonna call you up and be like, we've noticed you're the perfect parent. Can we interview you? Could you write a blog for us, right? They're not gonna do that, okay? I'm sorry. You're not gonna be the perfect parent. And that's okay. Can everybody in the room agree? It's okay that we're not perfect, but listen to this. There's really great news about this. That's why we don't trust ourselves. That's why we do need God's word constantly. That's why we do need the church. In other words, other Christians to come alongside us in this wonderful, beautiful battle that we have in life and help us along the way. We put all of our hope as imperfect people in the perfect Savior, Jesus Christ. He has been perfect for you. So kids, guess what? You can't be perfect, but Jesus has been perfect for you. Isn't that great? Right? Adults, same thing. Some of you, you you're just... You sweat with anxiety because you want to be perfect, right? You want to, to be this version of yourself that everyone will admire, but you can't. And it's okay because Jesus has been perfect for you and he stands in your place. The gospel tells us that Jesus Christ came to this earth and he lived a perfect life that we can't live and we never will. But he did that for you. And then he died a perfect sacrificial death in your place. That should have been us because the Bible tells us that the consequence of our sin is death, right? And separation from God. But Jesus died. He paid that penalty for you in your place. And not only that, he rose from the grave. As we saw in baptism, when you come out of that water, you're a new person, right? Because that's a picture of what's already happened. Jesus has changed your life. You'll never be perfect, but you can follow the example of the one who has the one who is Jesus himself, whether you're a child or a parent. So kids, look to Jesus as your example. Jesus obeyed his heavenly father with joy, all the way, right away, with a happy heart. Parents, look to God, our father, as your example. He loves both justice and mercy. He is both patient and forgiving. He shapes our hearts to love him. And look to Jesus, parents who sacrificially loved you so that you could love him and you could love your children. Is Christ enough? Yes. He is the example for kids. He is the example for parents.
He's the example for all of us. 